heads, please. Man, we're going to do something this morning. I do. I truly want to exercise our faith together. Maybe you're online. Maybe you're on the radio. Maybe you're right here, and I just want us to truly exercise our faith together. If you are a parent, or if you are a brother, or if you are a sister, or if you are a husband, or you are a wife, or maybe you have a son, or maybe you have a daughter, or maybe you have a dear friend that would fall into this prodigal category, man. They, they once knew, right? They once knew, and yet sin has gotten the way that they are in such a place of desperation that maybe, and I believe this, that even as we are singing this, I'm asking God by his Holy Spirit to move in such a powerful way, even in this moment, like right now, if there is someone that you know, that once you knew that they followed the Lord, you knew that seeds of truth were planted within within them, and they truly knew, knew and do know the Lord. I believe that you are saved, man, but sin can get in like the prodigal. Jesus gives us this amazing picture of there was the son, and there is the father, and the son got so far from the father that he was in a place where he would look back to say, how did I get here? How did it get so bad? And maybe there's somebody that you love dearly in this exact moment that is going, how did I get this far? How did I get addicted to drugs? How did I get addicted to alcohol? How did I get addicted to porn? How did I get addicted to the world? How is it that I've gone so far from what I know to be true and they get stuck? There's this amazing phrase in Luke 15. But then he came to his senses. But then he came to his senses. And church, that happens in a moment. That happens in a moment. But then, then it happened. But then he came to his senses. And I believe that this is a powerful moment that we would stand in our faith. And as I pray, I'm going to pray. And if you have a loved one, if you have someone that is a dear friend of yours that they know, man, you know that they have gone so far. They have gone so far that maybe just today, maybe as we cry out and exercise our faith that in this group where two or three are gathered, that we truly will believe, God, that you will move in this moment, that their eyes will be open to the truth of the depth of your love and that a grace that is inexhaustible, that God's love for them is way deeper than any of their nonsense. It's way deeper than any of their sin, that their grace that God has for them is truly enough that they would get it that in this moment at 1143 on this Sunday morning that just maybe God by his spirit would bring such great conviction that they would realize I've had enough and they would come to their senses and they would know if I can just go home if I can just go home will I be received The son in the story in Luke 15 was like, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I don't deserve any of this. I just want to come and serve in my father's house. And dad was like, yeah, that's not the way it goes, son. You're my son. But my grace is enough. I remember dad would be on that porch and he would look for his son. Maybe today's the day. Maybe today's the day. Maybe today's the day. But then he came to his senses. And there was a day that the shadow of the sun came over the hill. And dad ran to his son. Church, I hope that this is that day. I don't know if you're online or if you're on the radio. And I just want to be able to pray over you and pray over the one that you love the most that's in this broken place that maybe just maybe today is the day that his eyes are open to the love of the Father and that grace is enough. 
come on, would you pray with me, please? And I believe God will do a mighty work in those who are going to be called back to the family and called back to the church where they would realize I don't even deserve this and they truly would repent from their sin. There would be a noticeable change because they've repented from their sin. They come back truly humble and ready to love Jesus with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength. Whenever you're in this place, would you just raise your hands with me, please? And let's just exercise our faith as we pray, and then Brennan's going to sing, and I'm going to believe that God is going to do a mighty work in this moment, church. In this moment, it takes a moment, and let this be that moment in Jesus' name. God, we pray for every person that we would know, every son or every daughter or every brother or every sister or our dear friend, or maybe it's a mom or maybe it's our dad or maybe it's a a deep, deep friend that we love dearly that has gone wayward for you and they've drifted. But God, there was a day that they knew you. There was a day that they served you and understand what it was to love you and to be loved by you. And God, I pray that in this moment, as we come before you in great belief and in deep faith to say, God, let it be in this moment right now, wherever they're at, whether it be a needle in their arm, whether it be pills, whether it be drugs, whether it be alcohol, whether it be men, whether it be women, whatever it would be, that God, they would turn from their wickedness. They would realize your deep love and your grace cannot be exhausted, that you love them, that your grace is enough for them, and they can come back to you in this moment, that God, they would repent and turn to you, and they would come to their senses, that their eyes would be open, they would see your hands held wide for them, to receive them in great love. God, let it be now. God, let it be right now, in this exact moment, throughout this land, that they would turn to you, that they would come to you again, that they would ask for forgiveness, that God, your grace, would cover them in a real way. God, let it be now, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on.
thank you for that promise today, Lord. Thank you for that truth. Lord, you clothed us in righteousness. Jesus, thank you for what you've done. You're so good to us, Lord. Thank you for this time. God, we honor you. Speak to our hearts through your word. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody said. Amen, amen. You may have a seat. We say thank you to our worship team, please. Come on, they're so good. We are so blessed. We are so, so blessed here at this church. Come on, turn me to Philippians chapter 1. Listen, I believe that we, we cry out to God in full belief and that there are going to be moments, if there have been moments even on this particular day. Maybe you'll hear about it a month from now. Man, there was the Sunday that that was when I turned like... I believe that, church. I want to hear the reports, man. I want to hear the reports. When they come in, please get a hold of the church. Get a hold of, of, of anyone in this church of leadership and, and let us know. I want to know the reports of what God is doing even on this day. Come on. Come on, we're in this, this starting kind of, we started two weeks ago, we took a break to really Speak about why Israel last week. If you missed that, please go back and, and, and look at that and watch that message and just continuously praying for Israel and, and that they catch the bad guys, those who are evil, those who have come against them and have taken their children, taken their wives, taken their, their dear friends, evil Hamas, that they would be wiped out and eliminated would be tremendously wonderful. Um, but pray for Israel. Pray for God's chosen people. Last week we talked about that as, as necessary. And then this week we're getting back into Philippians. And, and church, we love the Bible here. We are Bible people. We love the Word of God. We believe the Word of God gives us that which is right. The Word of God exposes lies and exposes darkness, and it just it gives us truth. And, you know, when you look at different counterfeits, like if you are in a, a FBI or a federal government that is in the counterfeit business of identifying counterfeits, they spend, I don't know the exact number, it's like 90% of their time studying the real thing. They don't study the counterfeits. Counterfeits change all the time. If you know the real thing, then you can identify the counterfeit. They study the real thing and know the real thing in every single detail of that so then when counterfeits come, and they come in all kinds of different ways, they identify the counterfeit easy because they know the real thing. The Bible gives us the real thing. The Bible is the truth. Therefore, you can identify the lie quickly because you've studied the truth. If you study every lie and every counterfeit out there, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out the counterfeit if you just know the truth. We are Bible people here. We love the Word of God. We are excited that you are with us. And as you're in Philippians 1, I just want to start this morning with Jeremiah chapter 15. And it says this. I love this. Uh, Jeremiah says this, verse 16. Your words were found, and I ate them. Your words were found, and I ate them. There is this hunger. There is this need for spiritual food. As much as your body needs food, your spirit needs the word. The word is our spiritual food. This is what we grow on. Your words were found and I ate them and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. Like he loved the word. He ate the word as spiritual food. They became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. Philippians is this book that we have, this letter that we have written by Paul as he's in prison that gives us this picture of a supernatural joy and a supernatural peace. We're going to be in this letter probably all the way up to December. Uh, I'm going to take my time through Philippians. I am juiced about Philippians. I'm excited to bring so much of these things out of Philippians. Paul wrote this because he had such an incredible affection for the church at Philippi. This was his favorite church. He loved this church. He writes this letter while he's in prison. He writes it in a way that says, listen, when everyone else has forgotten about me, you were there for me. He, he, he loves their loyalty. He loves their friendship. He loves their fellowship. He loves how, how faithful they have been to Paul. This isn't a corrective letter. He's not like, hey guys, stop getting drunk on the communion juice. Like, 
he had to do that to the Corinthians. Hey, Corinthians, stop sleeping with the church prostitutes. Like, don't do that. That's bad. Like, he's like, hey, don't sleep with your mother-in-law. That's bad. Like, this is, like, these are all problems within the church. Not this church. If you get drunk on our grape juice, um, you're lying. So anyways, because it's grape juice, unless it's really old, been in that little packet for a long time when you drink a box of it. Anyways, um, like, the reality is, this is not that letter. This is different. It's a letter that just screams of a supernatural joy, a heart that is filled with gratitude and thankfulness for a group of people that he has now known for over 10 years. It started 10 years ago, and he writes this letter to saying, I love you. I thank you for all that you've done for me, and it has given us such a joy in his spirit, even in prison. Stunning. Stunning. Church, I want us to be hungry for the word. I want to know your in devotions, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. What a great song that we're singing to understand. Like, not, not just Sunday sitters. I don't want a church that's just filled with Sunday sitters. I want a church of people that are hungry, starving for the word. And it's not like I have to. Oh, I have to get in the word today. I have no. Fall in love with the word. If you fall in love with Jesus, you fall in love with the word. And man, come on, let's look at this in Philippians chapter one. I want you to see this. And, and, and I want you to just kind of look at a few verses here. Uh, like I said, man, it's probably going to take us all the way up to December. Then we'll start kicking into some Christmas. This year's whole Christmas thing is majesty in a manger. Majesty in a manger. And we're going to blow up the kingship of Jesus and looking at his majesty and his royalty and his magnificence and his excellence and his glory. And all of that was bound up in a little bundle in a manger. And we're going to just... Have a blast with that through December, man. It's going to be powerful. And that 24th of December, that 24th of December, that is a Sunday. We're going two services in the morning, and then we're, we're jamming into our Christmas Eve service on the 24th. It's going to be an incredible season and an incredible time. And I'm just giving you the little pregame on that so you can get ready for it. Come on, Philippians 1, 1. Paul and Timothy, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, and to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank my God and all my remembrance of you. Always offering, I love this, always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all. I thank my God and all remembrance of you. I thank my God and all remembrance of you. Always offering prayer and joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel. Highlight that. Circle that. Underline that. Do something with that. In view of your participation in the gospel. Those four words. Participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am convinced that this very thing, whom he began a good work in you, will perfect it or complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart since both my imprisonment and both the defense and confirmation of the gospel that you are partakers of grace with me. Like this is Paul saying, listen, church at Philippi, you are my people and I love you and I pray for you and I can say all this because you participate in the gospel. Like we're on the same team. And I, listen, I know that this is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I'm so grateful. Renee and I pumped. We love Pastor L. He's our other pastor that is on staff here. He is the greatest care pastor on the planet. He will be at the hospital at any hour, at any moment. He will be in your house at any hour, at any moment. He will be on the phone. Like, Pastor Al is the picture of a true care pastor. It's amazing, amazing. We are honored and blessed to have Pastor Al and Phyllis, like truly. And uh but for me, it's like I can put myself in this story, man. I can read this and say, God, I am honored and I am blessed. I love this church. I love Believer's Chapel. I love the people of this church. We have the greatest staff. We have the greatest team. We have the greatest volunteers. He, hear me. You don't have church if you don't have people. You do not have a church if you do not have people. People are the church. And I'm telling you, man, it is truly my honor and my privilege. I love that God has taken me out of police work. That's what I thought I was going to die with, man. I loved the police force. I loved everything about that full-time police. I loved it. To be able to call to this ministry and to be able to call to this church, which was never on the radar. Renee married a cop. She didn't marry a pastor. Like This was never on our radar of our goals in life. But to know how God has orchestrated every detail of this. And we love 
this church. As Paul's writing this, I'm like, I know the feeling, Paul. I have the greatest people in our community, in our region, at Believer's Chapel, and we're participating in the gospel together. I want to just tell you, man, I love you. And it's an honor and a privilege for me to be called the pastor of Believer's Chapel. We are here. We're doing a work. God is moving mightily. We need to win this region. Church, this is the beginning for Believer's Chapel. If the Lord would tarry, if he's not coming back anytime soon, which I believe he could come any moment, but if he waits, that's his choice. Uh, We're going to do a magnificent work here, and we're all in this thing together because we're the church, and we're doing something significant here in this region, and it is truly an honor to be able to be called pastor of this church, and I love you, and I'm excited. I can feel Paul and what he says here because I put myself in his shoes to say I know a people and I love the people. And I do, man. I'm honored to be here with you. And I thank God for this church. And I thank God for this work. And I thank God for my team and my dear, dearest friends who are our team. I appreciate my man Matthew Bryan ah, so much. And what we're doing together is just incredible. Churches is a great work. This is such a great work. But the reality is when you see Philippians 1, it talks about everybody doing the work. It talks about everybody doing the work. I want to dig into this. And I want to see this. Everyone loves verse 6. For I'm confident of this very thing. We've quoted it. We know I'm confident, man. I am persuaded of this very thing. That he, meaning God, who began a good work in you, he will perfect it or he will complete it. He will finish the job even until the day Jesus comes. Man, I am convinced that God is doing something. He began a good work in me. And I believe that he is going to perfect it. I believe his promise. But maybe we're like, no, I do. I love verse 6. Man, I love that he started something to me and I know that and I know that he's going to complete it because he promised that all the way up till Jesus comes back, but it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't seem like anything's happening. It seems like I've started something and he said he's going to finish it, but I don't see that. I don't feel that. I don't think that's happening. What's going on? And I love it because we love verse six. But what comes before verse six? Is verse 5. Verse 5, watch this, keep it in context. Verse 5 is the pregame to the promise of verse 6. When you read scripture, ask questions, keep things in context. Ask questions, keep verses before, keep verses after, put them all together and say, ah, Ooh, now I see, like, I love verse six. That's a promise. He began a good work and you will perfect it. He will complete it. Man, he will finish the job all the way up until Jesus comes back. God gave me a promise. He's going to finish it. But yet we love that. But let's, let's look at verse five because verse five says, in view of your participation in the gospel. Oh, wait, wait. So like God started something in me and he's going to perfect. He's going to see it through. But yet, I, I'm supposed to be participating in the gospel. I'm supposed to be a player in this game. You mean I'm, I'm, I'm called to do something as a follower of Christ? Sean, you're saying that I'm called to get in the game. Sean, you're saying that I'm supposed to participate in view of, what? In view of, I, I'm, I see that you are participating in the gospel from the first day until now. Because of that, I am convinced. Do you, see, do you see how one has to go in the next, right? You got the pregame of the participation in the gospel that goes into the, the verse that we love. Paul says, no, I know that you are participating in the gospel in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And now I see and, and I believe and I have been persuaded and I have been convinced that he began a good work and you will perfect it. Until the day of Jesus Christ. Like so, and the day of Jesus Christ is his return. So church, we need need to look at this and say, okay, what what is it then? What is it? Because I want to believe the promise. I want to believe the promise 
that he who began a good work in me, he's going to complete. I want to believe that. So then what does it mean to participate in the gospel? And I encourage you to ask questions when you read the Bible. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The question is, how has Christ loved the church? Make yourself a list and then just go do that. I promise you, it'll make a difference in your marriage by asking a simple question. Don't just read Matthew 5.25 or Ephesians 5.25 and just go through that and say, oh good, yeah, love your wife as Christ loved the church. No, what is it to love your wife as Christ loved the church? Stop. Okay, great. How has Christ loved the church? Make a list and it's a constant growing list. Go and do that and your marriage will be different. Your marriage will be different. Your wife will be like, who are you? What'd you do? What'd you do with my man? Like, you know, in a good way. So what does it mean to participate in the gospel? To be able to buy into verse five or buy into verse six to participate in the gospel. And let's look at verse nine. It says this, and this, I pray that your love may abound still more and more. Again, this is to the church. This is to a church, a body of believers, just as BC. And this, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and discernment. This I pray. This is part of Paul praying. Listen, I love you and I'm praying for you. You were in my prayer life. Well, this is one of his prayers as he's speaking about this church that he has the most affection for. He's like, listen, I see your love and I'm praying that you go to the next level. I am praying that your love may abound. That means there's love, but let it overflow. Let it go from one level to the next level. Church, our participation in the gospel, one of those Areas of our participation in the gospel is our love for one another. Listen, we have an amazing church. We have an amazing community. And I think there is a deep love for one another in this community. And I love it. But there can always be more. Paul is writing this as, as a letter to a very mature church. Philippi was mature. They had it going. They were active. They were giving. They were serving. They were loving. And Paul says, I am praying that the love that you have would overflow more and more. Church, I pray that the love that we have for one another in this church, it would abound. It would overflow. And it would go from this level to the next level. And you think you tapped out. And then it goes to another level. And you think you've reached it. And then it goes to another level. And there is this deep, true love for one another in this church. That is a part of our participation in the gospel. As Paul says, I am praying for you that your love for one another may abound more and more. In real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent. So that you may approve the things that matter most. This is what excellent means. That, that you may approve the things that mean the most. Church, we started this church in 2009, May of 2009, in our living room, and we had a plan that what matters most, we will be a family church. We are going to invest a lot into family, that is husband and wife, and we're, we're going to do, uh, probably starting after the whole Christmas deal, starting January, we're going into a marriage series, and I'm pumped about that. Already looking forward to January in our marriage series. We invest a ton in husband and wife. We invest a ton financially, time, volunteer for our children's ministry, for Kingdom Kids. We invest a ton into our youth ministry for, for Breakaway, amazing volunteers that serve in so much of our children's ministry. Like, it's incredible how much we invest financially, time-wise, volunteer-wise into our children's ministry. This was our goal from our living room. And the amazing thing is there are so many of you even here today in this service now and even in the 9 a.m. that were in our living room on day one and you have been so faithful and you have been so loyal and you are a part and you see all that God is doing from the living room to Constitution Ave. You have seen it all. And to that, I am juiced about those who've been so faithful, those who've been so loyal, those who, who say I was there on the couch on day one and to see the growth, Sean, in you as a pastor, to see the growth and maturity in growth, to see the growth of the church, to see the mighty hand of God move in so many different ways. Like there are so many that have been so faithful 
and they see the investment that we've made from the beginning. Why? Because what matters most? This is what Paul is saying. This is what Paul is saying. And what does it look like, church, to invest so much into marriage, into family, into raising kids God's way, investing so much in children that love church, then grow up not liking church. I want them dragging you to church. When you're tired on a Sunday, I want, I want them to look you in your eyes and say, no, Ma, we're going to church. That you're like, I can't say no to that. Let's go to church. I want that. I want that. We've wanted that from our living room. What matters most? What, what is that level of excellence that you put the most into? This is what he's saying here. Approve the things that matter most, that are most important, that which is best in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. There it is again. You, you see until the day of Christ. You see that in verse 6. You see it in verse 10. Make a line, draw that, circle that until the day of Christ. Here, until Jesus return, this is the participation of the gospel. Like until Jesus comes back, we need to be busy doing these things. Circle that, draw a line to it. You see that in verse six. You see that in verse 10. And then it says this, right? So the things may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled, that means to be complete, with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. The fruits of righteousness. Again, participation in the gospel. Paul's like, I'm used to see what I see in this church, but a part of that is the fruit of righteousness. What is fruit? Fruit is evidence of that which has been planted. That's what fruit is. Right? If you, if you plant corn, you get corn stalks. If you plant bananas, you get banana trees. I don't even know if there's a seed for bananas. <laughs> Is there a seed for bananas? Probably not. Just squish it in the ground and just watch banana tree grow. Is that what we do? I want a banana tree. I don't know if we have the weather for it, but that would be, I like bananas. It would be fun. So like, like but the, the reality is, what is fruit? That's evidence of that which was planted. What is your proof that you're doing and acting and participating in the gospel to that which God said is right. But like this wasn't an easy time for the, the church at Philippi. These guys were under severe persecution. They, they were being hunted and they were being pursued. Persecution means to be aggressively pursued. They were being aggressively pursued in the season that Paul is writing this. As a letter to build courage. Encourage means to build courage in another. He wrote this letter to encourage, to build courage in those who are in great pursuit and being aggressively pursued in persecution. So he's like, hey, what is the fruit? What is the evidence? What is the proof that you are standing firm on that which is right according to what God said is right? And man, am I, am I, oh my, we, uh, we have a day right now. Ladies and gentlemen, that you and I are called to stand on that which is right according to what God said is right. This is why we live and breathe according to the word of God. We love the word of God. God's word exposes evil. God's word exposes lies. And we are in this perverse generation right now. It is perverse. It is ugly. It is nasty. People are buying into so many lies and stories. And we look to God's word to say, no, I want proof. I want fruit of righteousness that I'm participating in the gospel. And me participating in the gospel means I have to stand for that which is right. That's proof. That's fruit of righteousness. There's seeds that are planted that bear fruit and prove that I'm standing on that which is right. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel and I'm not moving from the gospel and I'm not moving from the truth. Church, that, this is the start of this participation in the gospel. And then Paul goes through this next section and he speaks about the, just what it is to preach the gospel what it is to stand firm on the word of God, to stand firm and preach the gospel at all costs, preach the gospel. And church, you look, you look at Believer's Chapel and you look at the different things that are happening here in this church, right? You look at all of our different ministries. You, you, look, at, you look from Sunday morning. And again, we can't have Sunday sitters. This is that message that is like, okay, I, I love that you're here on Sundays. Man, this is our day to gather as the Church of Believers Chapel, the gathering, the assembly, the congregation. But we can't just be here on a Sunday morning. 
We just can't be here sitting on a Sunday and, and just think we can't do anything with it on Monday or Tuesday. No, it is our prayer. It has been our prayer. It is our prayer this week. It will be our prayer this upcoming week. And then the following week, it's what we pray. God, that people would come in this place and that they would hear your word and by your Holy Spirit, you would move in such a powerful way that would bring a deep, deep conviction that every single one of us walked out of this place different from when we came in this place. We don't want to be Sunday sitters. We don't want to be just checking a box on Sunday. We want to be in your presence and God that you would move in such a powerful way that we walk out challenged. We walk out changed. We walk out ready for the week that God, you will do something amazing on a Sunday that has an effect on Wednesday. And we pray that and we pray that and we pray that and we pray that so we just don't have Sunday sitters that say, hey, what have you done for me lately? But it's no, wait a minute, a minute, ho, 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 ho. No, we need to be participators of the gospel. We need to be participating in the gospel. We are called to do a mighty work and do it together and see what God is going to do here in this region. And church, every one of our ministries is Bible foundational based on truth from glow to flourish to warriors to, to defenders to Sunday morning to everything we do at Kingdom Kids to voyagers to breakaway to bridge to living connected groups to our small groups in the bridge. I mean, you name it, it's the Bible. From men's ministry to women's ministry, studying the book of Acts, men's ministry is, men's ministry is going through the, the, the truth of God's word on being a kingdom man. Like, everything is founded in his word. I want you to be hungry for his word as being participators of the gospel in view of your participation of the gospel. Church, we need to stand firm on his word and stand firm on the truth of his word as Paul goes through the importance of, of his word, importance of what it was even to be in prison, that it, that it helped in the push of the gospel. Come on, turn me please to Acts. I want you to see this in Acts chapter 2. And I think this is an, an amazing four-point definition found in Acts of even their participation in the gospel. And I truly want you to see this because I, I really believe that as we see in Jeremiah 15, 16, that there is a, a supernatural joy that comes. Joy and rejoice is mentioned 16 times through the book, the book of, of Philippians. 16 times, New American Standard. 16 times, joy or rejoice. You see a supernatural peace in chapter 4. We're going to get to that in a, in, in a while. It's going to be a bit, but we're going to get to chapter 4. And we're going to look at this true, this supernatural peace, this peace that comes from God and not from us, but it's a supernatural internal job of peace. Despite circumstance, despite the surrounding, there's a peace that comes. And there is a supernatural joy that comes. John 15, Jesus says, my joy I give to them. That, that's a, a holy God almighty from divine himself, a joy that comes from Jesus. My joy I give them. That's an amazing statement that Jesus said to me and you. It's a supernatural joy. And when we see this, when you begin to participate in the gospel, as we see this in the very first you know, last two weeks ago was a big intro. This is, the, this is the meat and potatoes of going through Philippians. You begin to see what is it to participate in the gospel. And in my participating in the gospel, man, something is happening, not even because of my circumstance. Happiness comes from happenings. That supernatural joy just comes because of the Holy Spirit. And when I am working in and through by the power of the Holy Spirit, there is this beautiful joy. Could you put up Romans 15, verse 13? I want to hit this real quick. And then we got a cruise in Acts 2. Short time, short time. Here we go. And may the God of hope, this will be our verse, man. This will be a foundation verse for this series through Philippians. And it says this. Now may the God of hope fill you. That means to overflow with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound again, overflow in what? In hope. By how? The power of the Holy Spirit. I love this. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And now may the God of hope fill you. That means to be complete. That means to be full. What are we going to be filled with? Joy 
and peace. And, and then we are going to abound in hope. That is that confidence. That is that faith. That is that expectation. It's going to overflow in us. How? It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is not circumstantial. That is because of the Holy Spirit that reigns and dwells within us. There is this power, there is this authority that by the Holy Ghost that reigns within us, there is this joy and there is this peace that I can overflow in that confidence of hope because God's Spirit reigns within. This is where I want us to be in this study. This is where I want us to be in this study. As when we're going through Philippians, there is something taking place within your spirit that you are understanding what it means that by the power of the Holy Spirit, man, I am overflowing. I have that supernatural joy and I have under, understanding of that supernatural peace because I am participating in the gospel. And God has started something good in me and he is going to perfect it. He is going to complete it all the way up until Jesus comes home. And then I won't need him to because I'm going home. And everything is perfect in heaven. Acts 2 says this, verse 37. I want to start here. It, it pregames into the big four things. We'll hit them quickly. This is, this is after the Holy Spirit shows up. Earth shakes. Room fills with smoke. Spirit baptizes all. And the room is just an amazing moment. Uh, Spiritual language was taking place. And then they go out and Paul just begins to preach. Or I'm sorry, Peter just begins to preach. Peter just goes out on fire. And he's preaching what it is to repent, what it is to be baptized, what it is to believe, what it is to surrender. He's just preaching the gospel, man. He's going for it. He's going for it. And there's a huge response. And I want you to see this. And now when they heard this, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, your children promises the Holy Spirit. The promise, because the Holy Spirit was promised, the promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far off as many as the Lord God would call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this, I love this, be saved from this perverse generation. We need a serious repentance and we need this perverse generation that we are now living in to turn away from their wickedness, to turn away from their lies, turn, turn away from the darkness and truly come to Christ and be saved through repentance, belief, and surrender. Exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who have received his word were baptized. And the day they were added, and on that day they were added about 3,000 souls. This is, a, this is huge, man. This is a kickoff and a huge start to the church. We are in the, the, the church age right now. You had the, the pregame before the cross, you've had the cross, and now you have the, the, the postgame of the cross, and this is considered the church age, here and now. And this is Peter, he's preaching, 3,000 souls come to him, they repent, they turn from Jesus, or turn, turn from their sin to Jesus, they are baptized, and then watch what he says. After all of this, this is what started taking place. Look at this, verse 42. And they were continually devoting themselves. Okay, we got saved. We're in church. What next? These 3,000 souls, which just continue to grow. There's a picture in Acts that says day after day. Numbers were being added to the church. And they continually devoted. Continually devoted, it means they were faithful. They persevered. 
they, they, they had a zeal. It's not just a, a, a hard time of persevering. It is with an, with an intensity. It is with a diligence. It is with a passion. It is with a zeal that they were continually devoted. Man, they, 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 they were faithful. They were loyal. Man, they, they continued. They persevered. They were diligent. They had a passion about them for the church. This, this is what this picture looks like. They were continually devoting themselves to four things. The apostles' teaching. That's just, that's just Bible teaching. The apostles were preaching. They were in. They couldn't wait. Taking their notes. Wow, speak that again. Preach it again. Preacher Peter, can you say that again? Like, like they are going on. They were hungry for the teaching of the apostles. Church number one, that's just Bible teaching. We've talked about it already in this church. It's at every level that we have in this church that the foundation is the word. Participation in the gospel. Get yourself under some solid Bible teaching. Number two, watch this, and I love this. Number one is the, is the apostles' teaching. That's just simple Bible teaching. Number two is fellowship. They were continually devoting themselves to Bible teaching, and they were continually de- with a passion and a zeal. This word fellowship in the Greek, it's koinonia, and that means that, that it has a sense of worship to it. It has a sense of gathering. It ha- has this, this sense of deep friendship. It has this sense of community. It's a big word of what does it mean to fellowship? To be a part of a community? To be a part of a people group? To be a part of those who are like-minded? to be a part of those who will worship together. This is the community. This is the fellowship of Believer's Chapel. You will see many churches that have this word koinonia, or they'll put fellowship in their actual church name, the fellowship of. Right? They understand this. We are a community of people. They were continually devoted to being with one another. They were continually devoted, de- devoted to gathering together for the sake of fellowship, for the sake of being together, for the sake of a deep friendship All of this has to do with this word. Number one, continually devoted to Bible teaching. Number two, continually devoted to that fellowship, to that that communion, to that community, to the sake of, of one another. Number three is the breaking of bread. They were continually devoted to the breaking of bread. That's eating together. There's two parts to this. That's eating together. There's also the Lord's table, man. That's the communion. So what is it to have a meal? Part of that fellowship and that koinonia? What is it to gather together and have a meal? What is it to gather together and to break bread? I mean, I love to get with people and eat. I love to get together. A lot of our meetings have to do around food. A lot of our time, even staff at times, has to do around food. We love our work parties here because we get food at work parties. There's so much about being together and breaking bread and sitting at a table, having conversations, talking about the Steelers smoking this year. It's just incredible. Like this is what we talk around our table. It's how the Steelers are going to smack on the, the, the Rams t- today. It's going to be incredible. Four o'clock. Fox, if you want to watch it and be a part, bring out your towel. It'll be incredible. But like, so number three is that breaking of bread which has to do with communion as well. And then look at this, number four is what it is to pray. They were passionate. They had a zeal. They had a diligence. Church, you think about your participation in the gospel. You belong as a church to God Almighty. You consider yourself a part of this local church. We're just a sliver, man. We're just a sliver. We're not but you you, you consider yourself a part of this local church. And man, we want participation in the gospel. We want to see you dive into Bible teaching. We want to see you dive into what it is to build such deep friendships here in in, in your community, your koinonia, your fellowship, that you would eat with one another. And we have communion together and we would pray. Church, I tell you, there was moment I got out of college, you know, my testimony, got out of college, raised in an amazing Christian home, came to Christ at a young age, baptized at 11, loved Jesus, but yet got, you know, got into some things, went distant from God for just a little bit, not anything crazy, not any drugs, probably drank too much, and, and, and it, it, it is what it is, but came out of college, like I'm 21. Get out of college, and I'm like, Dad, I can't go back to the church we came from. I need a little more juice. Nothing on that church, I just needed more juice. He's like, you need to go down to this, this new church. And then I went to the new church. And then, man, it just, it was great because it was, it was, 
my flow, man. It was my flavor. And just at that point, like even before the church, I knew I have a longing for Christ and just started to come back to Jesus and just really started to really fall in love with Jesus again. And watch this now. In falling in love with Jesus, I started falling in love with his word. Just you got to understand something. I love to ski. I wish I could ski like I used to ski, but legs don't do what they used to do. And I love to ski, right? I got a lot to learn. I would love to be better at skiing. Like I loved it. it you, you couldn't get me off a hill to go to church. Like I went to, like growing up, growing up at my house, we had church Sunday morning and we had then we had church Sunday night and then we had, and then we had church on Wednesday and then we had prayer meeting and mom and dad, you know, they owned the Christian bookstore. They knew every Christian on the planet in this region and we couldn't get away from church and I don't like church. I'm like, I don't like church. I'd rather go skiing on Wednesday. Dad, I'd rather go play football on Wednesday. No son, you're going to church. I'm grateful for it, but I didn't like church. So when I go and I fell in love with Jesus and I fell in love with his word, I fell in love with church. And I would leave the slopes of Holiday Valley on a Thursday night to make sure I made it to church in time at seven o'clock to make sure I didn't miss the Bible teaching at seven o'clock. And then I'm like, God, this is amazing and I'm growing and I love you and I love your word. And all of a sudden it was okay, it's time to serve. It's time to participate in the gospel. I went to the pastor and said, man, I will do anything to just serve the church. I just want to serve. There's a desire in my heart just to serve the local church. And I cut grass. I clean toilets. Literally, I was just like, I'll do it all. I'm just a cop, man. I'm just doing what I want to do as a cop. Couldn't wait to get to church to serve. I was there first to be, to be praying. Like, whatever it takes, I'll just serve. And listen, we don't need anybody to cut the grass. We got Alan. It, it, Alan smokes our grass. It's incredible, man. You know, he doesn't smoke our grass. <laughs> That doesn't sound right. He does not smoke grass, nor our grass. He's great at cutting it. I don't need anybody to cut the grass. Woo, let's pray. You ready to sing? We're ready to go. <laughs> um, but then that turned into what it was to serve at a youth ministry, and then what it was to serve as a home group leader where you're supposed to have 12, and we had 70 in our home group. And I'm like, this is nuts. And what it was to serve as an assistant pastor and then what it was to serve, like it just kept from a desire just to cut grass. Because I can testify to this for myself, is the most growth that I've ever experienced in my faith was when I started to serve the church. There's something to serve it that grows your faith. Come on, if we can just stand to our feet, please. just going to close out in a song, man. I know it's a little late, but I just, I just want to know where you're at in this. What has God spoke to you this morning? In owning verse six, but like going through verse five first, I know, and I believe that God has called us to greatness. And I believe that God has put a desire in your heart that he started something in you and he will complete it. It's a promise, but it goes through verse five in view of your participation in the gospel. Take these things today. And I'm asking, what has God spoke to you this morning? If you need prayer for any reason, man, we would love to pray with you right up front. Come on, let's close this out.